Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Let's see by show of hands who has attended a previous Science for Life, maybe even two weeks ago. I thought you all looked really familiar. Thank you so much for being here. So that was your thank you to the guests who have attended the event in the past. And the new people, may I see your hands? Oh, good. You get to hear my joke for the first time. It's been an exciting year for Seattle. And we can now say for the first time in history that we are home to the Super Bowl champions. True world champions. The Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center is also home to true world champions. We call our Lombardies Nobel Prizes, and we've won three. Thank you, I like the laughter again. <laughs> our teams of world-renowned scientists are seeking new and innovative ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer and other life-threatening diseases. Much of our work is funded through grants, but with federal dollars declining, private contributions are becoming more and more essential, and they really do help us expedite important medical breakthroughs. We're really glad you're here tonight for Science for Life. This free community event series provides a glimpse into the exciting science conducted right here at the Hutch. Science for Life breaks down the concepts, skips the homework, and offers a chance for you to interact with world-class researchers in what we hope is a fun and informal atmosphere. So a couple of quick details before I introduce tonight's speaker. We will have wireless mics circulating throughout the presentation, so if you could wait until the mic gets to you before you ask your question, then we will not only be able to hear it better, but we are recording this, and others will be able to hear your question as well. There is a dedicated Q&A at the end of Dr. Radich's presentation. And as I did last time, I'd like to ask you all to please turn your cell phones to airplane mode or off. Simply having them on silent will still interfere with the AV uh, system. So thank you for that. I'm really pleased tonight to introduce you all to Dr. Jerry Radich, a member of the Clinical Research Division the director of the Molecular Oncology Lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and professor of medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Radich is chair of the Leukemia Translational Medicine Committee of the Southwest Oncology Group. He's co-chair of the NCI NIH Leukemia Steering Committee and he serves on the board of scientific counselors, the NIH Genome Research Institute. He also belongs to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network and the Euro Leukemia Net CML committees. And he's on the scientific board of the International CML Foundation. Dr. Radish's laboratory work centers on the molecular biology of response, resistance, and progression in adult and chronic leukemia. We're very fortunate this evening to have Dr. Jerry Radich present his work. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Radich. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for um, showing up. I'm Jerry. Um, what I do here at the Hutch, I take care of cancer patients, leukemia patients. I'm a bone marrow transplanter. And in my other hat, I basically try to find out why people relapse and why they respond. And I'm going to be referring a lot back to this chart tonight. And it's because this is a schematic of really what I've spent you know, my life doing. Um, if you imagine, this is, says leukemia, but this is any kind of cancer. When people show up in the emergency with leukemia, they have about 1,000 billion leukemia cells in their body. And what happens is you can take kind of three paths. There are those people who just don't respond to any therapy. There are some who get cured, remission, and long-term cure. And there's the most that basically first respond and first relapse. And in a way, what my lab does is we study the molecular biology of luck, right? Because we all know patients, we all know family members, we all have friends who should have done well with their cancer and didn't. And there are some people we know that should have done horribly with their cancer and they do great, right? That just can't be luck. There's gotta be some biology to that. And so what we're trying to do is figure out if you can look at people up here and tell who's going to go on which pathway. And then once you go here, which ones will keep going down that way and which ones go back up this way. With the idea that if we knew that, we could actually 
change therapy, and basically abort a relapse. Okay? So that's the, the, the theme of tonight's show. So throughout this, because we want to keep this kind of casual and lively and stuff, if, if someone has a burning question, we have question and answers at the, at the end. But you know, if I say something stupid or incomprehensible, well, there's a pretty good chance of both of those things. Um, it, it, you just raise your hand and, and say, what on God's earth are you talking about or something. Right? And then we'll, we'll address it as we have to. So first, a little bit of terminology. So, so a lot of these, these slides are going to be a little bit too comprehensive, and I'll just show you what you need to know. This is what normal hematopoiesis is. So in your bone marrow, you've got these human stem cells. And they will differentiate and go into several lines of different types of cells. <coughs> Major branching point is becoming lymphoid cells. Those are the cells that have uh, immunity, memory, and the like, fight against viruses and fungus. And then the other side go into so-called myeloid cells, which are more responsible for fighting infections and the like, the granular sites. And so this is the major break. And because of that break, you have four different types of leukemia. And I'm going to be using these acronyms, so I want to just introduce you to them here. So if you have myeloid or lymphoid cells, that's myeloid or lymphoid, and then there's historical classifications of acute or chronic leukemia. Those were basically made when there was no therapy for any of these diseases, and acute leukemias killed people fast, and chronic ones took years. So then you have, so you have acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, chronic lymphoid leukemia, and chronic myeloid leukemia. And so predominantly what we're going to be talking about tonight are these two camps here. So everyone follow that right now? What so, is BFTE? Oh, bone marrow transplant. We'll get to that later. Sorry. See, I knew I would say something dumb, right? So these are complicated charts. Just look at this one. Because this is actually both optimistic and pessimistic in the same chart. So these are age-adjusted death rates of all the different kinds of leukemias, ALL, AML, CML, CLL, over since 1975 to 2005. So this takes care of the aging population to adjust for that. And what you see is that for most of these leukemias, like this one, CLL, or this one, ALL, or even AML, there's really been no change in death rates over the last 25 years. The only one where there is, is this chronic myeloid leukemia. And I was going to talk about that's because we know the genetic lesion that causes that disease, and we have a drug that affects that disease. So when that drug, which is called Gleevec or Imatidib, depending on what school of thought you are, when that was introduced here, this has plummeted off. So this shows you the value of understanding the genetics of a tumor and finding a compound that actually hits it. You can actually change the natural history of this disease dramatically. Now, the other thing, that's, that, that's the optimistic part. The pessimistic part is that a lot of these things haven't changed. And so I, when I tell the med schools and fellows, I'll say, well, look, you know, imagine if you work on AML, and your whole life career is spent on that. And all you have to do is increase survival by 1% independent of the other guy who's working on AML. So a lot of smart people work on AML, right? If everyone in their whole life work could, could change survival 1%, that disease would be curable, 100%, right? So that shows you what a daunting task there is. And that's because, as we'll talk about, Genetics is evolution, is mutation, is natural selection. Life has a four billion year head start on us humans figuring it out, right? So it's a hard task. So usually I, I, I hope that the fellows you know, take that as guys leading the charge and sometimes they just get despondent and look for jobs in the industry and stuff. <laughs> Backfires. So again, natural history of most diseases. Some fail therapy. Depending on what leukemia it is, that can be anywhere from 10% to 25%. Some go into remission. That's the one we want. And then the ones, the bulk, respond, and then they come back. So let's talk about a couple of these things. Let's talk about first is, can we predict who responds? So I want to talk about here is the Philadelphia chromosome. Now, CML is a remarkable disease because every case of CML will have a singular genetic lesion in the Philadelphia chromosome. It's a, the, it was the first genetic lesion found in any cancers. It's a reciprocal translocation of 9 and 22, so you get a long 9 and a short 22. 
That short 22 is called the Philadelphia chromosome because Peter Knoll discovered it in the Winstar Institute in Philadelphia. So that's the only reason. So what that does on a molecular basis is it puts two pieces of genes together that are usually far apart. There's this upstream part of the of BCR gene from chromosome 22, and that now gets hooked into this ABLE gene, the downstream enzymatic area of that. And that creates a completely new DNA, RNA, and then protein. Now normal ABLE, we really don't know what normal ABLE does, but we know it goes, spends some time in the cytoplasm, spends some time in the nucleus, right? Abnormal, BCR ABLE, hangs out entirely in the cytoplasm, and it does something different. It basically causes a proliferation of cells, so you get a lot more cells, and it causes a block in what we call apoptosis, so cells don't die. So that one single mutation completely bypasses the normal constraints of, of how you control proliferation and how you cause apoptosis. Right? And this is important because this is now the unique target that imatinib can uh, effect on is blocking this able kyrosine type uh, domain. The other thing we'll talk about soon is this is a unique target that we can monitor molecularly. We'll discuss this in a little while because this mutation, this new translocation, this new gene is in CML cells. It should be in no other cell, normal cell in the body. So it is a completely unique fingerprint of that CML clone. Now CML is really a fascinating disease because it has a completely stereotyped behavior. In the days before imatinib or before we could transplant, most patients would show up in the so-called chronic phase, which is basically just an expansion of what your normal white count is. So our normal white count in here is somewhere between four to, to 10,000. Most patients with CML have completely normal looking white blood cells, but there's hundreds of thousands of them. So it's just an increase in proliferation. But without curative therapy, every patient with CML, every patient, will go into an accelerated phase where they get new genetic abnormalities and they start accumulating these immature cells called blasts. And then blast phase where you get these very immature cells, all the normal hematopoiesis goes away because it's overcrowded by the CML cells and people die of infectious disease and platelets because their platelet counts are down, their white normal white cells are down. This is always, this is a critical phase. You can give chemotherapy and put someone back into chronic phase, but you put them back there, not back here. So this is a clock. This is a molecular clock that ticks in every patient. And you know, we really don't know what drives that. But it's maybe a very good model for other cancers, because you're starting from a normal cell, and you're just accumulating changes here to this critical phase. Now, what phase you're in completely drives how well you respond to therapy. So this is before imatinib. Your average patient with chronic phase, would, the survival would be about oh, 71 months because they transition to accelerated phase. And then blast crisis, if you're diagnosed with blast crisis, your average survival is five months. So very, very. So if you think about how you can study genetics, this is a, actually, I, I made this off. This is a cartoon that I made in 1987. That's how old I am. <laughs> We, we, th at that time, there was like five known genes that, that we knew was associated with cancer. One of them was this RAS gene. And this is what we knew about how RAS caused cancer. We said, okay, you have a uh, normal RAS, which affects this molecule and does this. And then a mutant basically keeps it in this stuck phase, so it's always revving this up. And that's what leukemia is, right? So, that's, that's in, so we used to have the model of one gene, one postdoc. You know, you were interested in the RAS gene, you got a postdoc, and you told your postdoc, for your next three years, you were gonna figure out what this does, right? So now, with the, with the sequencing of the human genome and with real changes in, in, in biotechnology, we can actually now sequence the genome. We can also look at what the, the expression of that gene, which, uh, just to go over the central dogma again, for those of you who did this, you've got your, D, you've got your DNA, which is your you know, chromosome makeup, that makes up these things called messenger RNAs. So the usual uh, model people use is that this is the master blueprint that's in, the, in, in your uh, master engineering place. mRNA are specific job site things, copies of things you want to get done. And then you make protein, which is the working horse, which is the enzymes and the like. So if you have a mutation, it can, it can basically cause a change in that protein, or it can cause mRNAs to go up, 
or down, and that kind of can change. You can give the normal protein, but just too much of it or too little of it, right? So we now can, can look not at one gene, right, and, and one mRNA. We can look at 30,000 of these things simultaneously, right? So now what it looks like is this, right? And so, and so if you start putting this together with, with many, many, many gene abnormalities, you see that you have a computational nightmare that no human can respond to, right? So this is why we, most of genetics now is on computers and it was with computational biologists because, you know, we nitwits who are clinicians and molecular biologists can't think in the type of math that has to get done to actually solve this type of problem. So this is, um, for those of you who are red, green, colorblind, I apologize. This is called the heat map. And so what we wanted to do is say, well, gee, since, since no one knows what happens between chronic phase and blast crisis, what happens if we look at what the whole genome does, what the whole gene expression does between chronic phase patients and blast crisis patients? How many things are different? Do you get some idea at all, right? So what this is, this looks at, these are all individual, as you go across in rows, these are all individual patients. And these are... 3,000 out of 30,000 genes that are different in blast crisis versus chronic phase. So it represents essentially what the clock is doing, right? So red are genes that are upregulated and green are genes that are downregulated. So you can see there's this whole big difference. You don't even have to be really be using your imagination very much to say that these chronic phase patients are very different than these blast crisis patients. Now, one of the things we face in dealing with molecular biology is this, is the disconnection between what a pathologist sees in a microscope and what's actually going on in the cells. So what this is here, this is just a scale that we do. And imagine this is a scale of red and greenness. So these people here are the most chronic phase. These people, since they have more red and more green, are more blast crisis, right? So that's just a scale of where they are on this continuum. These little dots here, all patients who were on initial imatinib trials were in chronic phase, got a response, then relapsed, but they look to the pathologist to be in complete chronic phase. Their counts are high, but they look under the microscope and they say, there's no blast here. These people just look like in chronic phase. But what you see is that, in fact, most of these patients look like progressive disease. And that's a theme that we find in, in, in all of leukemias is that progression, treatment response, Resistance, they're all the same thing for the most part. So this is a little complicated, but I'll show you how this kind of works. So this is looking again at, you can do some mathematical hand-waving and the like, and reduce that 3,000 gene set into six genes. And so you'd want this to be a difference in expression between chronic phase and blast crisis. You can't see this here, but these are all chronic phase patients. These are all blast crisis. That looks pretty good. And you can translate this into that scale that I showed before. These are all chronic phase patients, except this one. This is a pretty peculiar case, huh? And these are all blast crisis patients, and these are people who are in that transition zone of accelerated phase. So they're making a turn. So this looks kind of better than you could hope to, right? And what this shows here is you do this kind of gene expression and look at the score. And these are early chronic phase patients. These are patients who just walk in off the street or are in chronic phase, and you give them a drug and you say, do you respond or not? And these are patients who are resistant. They still look like they're in chronic phase. The pathologist says they're still in chronic phase. Right? So these people look much, much more like blast crisis. And this is probably why people who are resistant, even though they're in chronic phase, don't respond to therapy anymore, because they're not really chronic phase. What's interesting here is these, these two chronic phase, all these chronic phase patients, these early chronic phase, there are two outliers here who, even though they're brand new patients and they look to the pathologist to be in chronic phase, have gene expression signatures that are, uh, look like blast crisis. And those two patients, like blast crisis patients, didn't respond to therapy at all. And these patients here all responded to therapy, and these ones all didn't. So you can start to use this kind of thing to, to realize what type of patients may respond to therapy, what patients are may be less likely to respond to therapy. If this is really a, a, an indicator, you should be able to use it in different kinds of modalities, not just treatment to a matida, but maybe things like transplantation, which we do here. So these are all chronic phase transplant patients. Their relapse risk should be, be roughly about 10% if you take the whole gamish. And so the pathologist says these are all chronic phase patients. They should all do well. You do the gene expression in the core thing, and you say if you look like low chronic phase, 
you relapse rates 5%. If you are in, look like you're in chronic phase, but our gene signature says that you are more advanced, your, your relapse rate after transplant is about triple that. So again, you can get early ideas of what the biology, molecular biology is that's kind of promoting this type of bad response. So an even bigger push is this one. So one of the problems is in a lot of molecular biology and trying to, to, to deal with, with picking prognosis is you know, most patients, when we look at the refractory resistance, most patients are this. So if we have 25%, 25%, 50% will go like this. So they've got something, they respond initially. So whenever you're doing your type of gene expression signatures or mutation analysis, you're dealing with really kind of this group, which is the group that's not, is kind of the most problem with signal to noise. So what we said is, okay, why do, if, we, if this stuff really works, if genetic analysis really works, why don't we just take the outliers? Why don't we take this group that doesn't respond to anything? And this, that gets conventional therapy and lives happily ever after, and say that if we can't show a difference in those two, then we've got a close-up shop, right? If you can't find a difference in genetic predictors of those who do nothing and those that do great, then this whole approach is something wrong with it, right? So this is a response, you know, most of, a lot of cancer uh, treatment stuff are based on, on acronyms. You know, they, they, there's these therapies, CHOP, doctor, BLAM, all this kind of stuff, right? The, the, the giant, the giant interfer uh, study that, that I'll show in, in CML, the first uh, inter uh, imatinib's trial, was IRIS. It was the International Randomized Trial of Interferon versus STI-571, which was what the Gleevec drug was called then. And that was actually completely back-engineered because the head administrator for Novartis was named IRIS, right? So they designed the whole trial about her name. So... So um, this is the comprehensive analysis of refractory disease in acute leukemia, which is, of course, cardinal. Uh, and the reason that is is that uh, Tim Lay from St. Louis uh, is a huge cardinal fan. And, and I grew up in California, but my dad got signed with the cardinals when he was a kid, so I grew up as a great cardinal fan. So we engineered the whole study to basically on our love of the St. Louis cardinals. <laughs> and so what this does is this is, is, takes 200 patients, half that are resistant, half that are response, and this basically does basically everything we know how to do genetically. So we do, we look at their mutations in their DNA, we look at their expression of the mRNA, we look at something called microRNAs, we look at this thing called methylation, which is a way that, you ch that the genome up or down regulates genes. Um, and so in the old days, when I showed that study on RAS, in those days you did genetic studies by studying hundreds of patients and you're looking for one point mutation. So you often didn't get a lot of data, right? You know, if these mutations, one it was 25%, you had 25% that had mutation, the same percent that didn't. It was basically more patients than information, much more. Now, it's completely flipped. You've got 200 patients, and you literally, for each patient, you have roughly 300,000 points of data. So it's an, an immense deal. So what do you get out of this? Well, this just shows that how we're doing this. Is a, it's, it's a big administrative issue and uh, massaging with a lot of egos and stuff to actually get so many people to cooperate. But, it, but it, we've, got it to, we've got it to work. So what do you get out of this? Well, the two things you want to get out of this are two practical matters. One is you want to be able to, at the end of the day, say, I have a, a diagnostic panel. Those could be two gene mutations, a methylation site, uh, mRNA expression thing, just different parts of the genome that I can actually do quickly so when a patient walks in the door, I can say, yes, you are a responder, or no, you're not going to respond to conventional therapy. You go to plan B. You do experimental therapy, you do a transplant, don't waste your time. Because if a patient is going to respond, the worst thing you can do is have them get conventional chemotherapy. They get sick, they get infected, it doesn't do anything, you waste time. Time is their number one enemy that they're facing against. So that's one thing. Find the panel that tells us if you're a responder or not. The other thing is if you know the, the pathways, if you can actually look at what's different, you can look at the biological pathways that are different between responders and non-responders. And if you know that, some of those might be druggable. So you might be able to turn a non-responder into a responder if you know why they're different. Okay? So, 
This we got done, I, I, we actually went to, to Varmus, who's the head of the NCI, to pitch this. It was like going to the principal's office, right? Uh, but, <laughs> but we got the money, and we, got the, we actually got the data done uh, under budget and under time, and now the fund begins. It's all the analysis. So we, have, we have three separate teams of bio and mathematicians trying to get this data, because it's just it's globs of data. And here's just a preliminary look of, of what, what this kind of readout can do. So uh, this didn't show up too well. But imagine here that this is the probability of responding to induction therapy. Right? This is 0%. This is 100%. And what you can do is, you know, often with these, with these type of studies, um, you basically fit all the data to one model. You say, this one model is going to work. And then when you go to another study, the model doesn't work anymore. Right? So what we've done instead is we've taken 30 different models. And then we basically say, from that, you can get a probability of, of, from each model of how you're going to respond. So here's the type of patient who where all the models cluster. And basically, you can build these kind of clever gauges. Their, pro their median probability of responding to conventional therapy is 3.7%. Right? And that's the range, basically from 0 to you know, 7% or 8%. Right? So that's helpful. That's a patient that you probably would not want to bother giving conventional therapy to. right? Here are some others. Here's a patient who is going to do great on conventional therapy. Right? And here's a patient, again, with that it does terribly. And I think I've got these. And here's some where the models just don't work. There's going to be some patients where they just don't work. But when you say don't work, I mean, you, I, I could make the, the defense that this is what informed consent is, right? Instead of telling a patient, oh, we don't think you're going to respond, or you might, you might say, well, look, here's your median chance of response. It's roughly 20%, and here's the range, right? How lucky do you feel, right? I mean, I mean here's, you know, do you want to kind of go ahead with the conventional therapy, or do you want to take a chance to do something different? On the conference, you could say, you should respond. The median chance of you responding is 70%, but, you know, we've got models that predict you as worse as 30%. And you can actually start talking about doing clinical trials based on probabilities, not just saying we do everything the same way, right? So I think this is going to be a really an important approach to how we do things. All right, now we're going to flip. We're going to go to the next point. Most patients go into remission, and most of them relapse. So here's our armamentarium for looking at residual disease, so-called residual disease. This is, your C, this is a CML I said here, but it's any leukemia, any cancer. So you've got about 10 to the 12th cells here, 1,000 billion cells. Cytogenetic approaches, which means growing chromosomes in a Petri dish, uh, the sensitivity on that is about 5%. If, if you have anything less than 5% leukemia cells, you won't see it by cytogenetics. Remission is about here. So at remission, you still have roughly 10 to the 9th leukemia cells. So a pathologist goes in the, you know, if, if I got, came into the emergency room, and you found that I had leukemia, I would get my conventional chemotherapy, and then at about day 30, uh, they would do another bone marrow biopsy. And so this, you might be wondering, I've got props. So um, this is a bone marrow aspirate needle, but you'll get the idea. So there's these needles, right? So, so, so someone would put this needle in my backside and, and it's not very pleasant, as you can imagine, imagine from the size of the needle, um, and pull a marrow, and the pathologist would look at it, and he would look at it under the microscope and see if he could find any leukemia cells. And his odds of finding some, his sensitivity looking under the microscope is, again, around 5%. Leukemia cells actually look pretty much like normal cells, yeah, blasts, and so they aren't going to find it. So how are you going to look deeper? How are you going to look deeper? And so what I'm going to talk about a lot here is, is something called the polymerase chain reaction, which actually lets us get down to about a million-fold reduction. So as a, whereas a cytogeneticist can see 5 out of 100 cells, pathologists can see 5 out of 100 cells, with modern technology in the lab, we can actually see one leukemic cell in a million, back on a million normal cells. Right? And I'll show you why that's important. Now, how is that done? So you guys all watch these crime shows, right? So, so, so in the crime shows, they're always trying to find blood, right? Find, find, me some, some, find me some saliva, find me some blood, right? We're going to do the, the fingerprinting, right, to, to solve the criminal. So how they do that is by something called the polymerase chain reaction. And, and what that is, is if you can imagine that um, my arms, if they're flexible enough, is a strand of DNA. 
And uh, when I'm going to divide and become two cells, uh, you unwind the DNA, and then these things called polymerases read one strand and basically duplicate that, read the other strand, duplicate that, and then you break off and you've doubled your DNA that goes its separate ways, right? So you can do that in the lab. So what you do is you basically boil the DNA, so that unravels it, and then you um, basically add these polymerases, cool it down a little bit, and that starts elongating the, the strand, and then you basically repeat the procedure, so you've gone from you know, one strand to two strands, you boil again, those strands fall apart, you make the, a second copy, so you get an exponential amplification. So you get one, two, four, et cetera. If you do that 30 times, you get about a million-fold amplification. Okay. So when this first happened, um, it was first described, you, you did this by, and I'm just do, doing historical stuff here because it's kind of fun to see where, we, where we've gone from, right? You did this in water baths, three different temperature water baths, and you timed it. So you went to, you went to the bathroom, got some reading material, because you were going to sit at this one place for four hours. And you basically, you know, for one minute, then you moved it to the next one, and then you, two minutes, you moved it to the next one, then you moved it back. But every time you boiled the DNA, the polymerase, the enzyme, would degrade. So you'd have to, like, add new enzyme and do the same thing again. So this was cool to do, but it was completely unscalable. It could, it's completely useless for big projects, right? So this is why sometimes basic research that no one wants to, to uh, fund, because they say, oh, what, what the heck is that going to do, right? It actually means a big deal, right? So when this paper first came out in 1987, like this guy named Barnaby uh, read about it. And Barnaby was in an upstate hospital in New York State. He was in the hospital because he studied thermophilic bacteria and he fell in a hot spring and he burned his leg badly. So he was in the hospital reading this. And he's reading this and said, this is what he marked with it. It sprung up. He says, well, wait, I work on bacteria that duplicate their DNA and divide every day. I mean, that's, they, live, they live at 100 degrees, right? And so they must have polymerases that can survive boiling forever, right? And so he cloned that gene and that insight revolutionary biology because once you could do that, you could put all your ingredients in this test tube, set the thermal cycling profile and walk away. Never had to touch the tube again. And basically everything we do in this talk, everything about genome sequencing and everything is based on that observation that, that thermophilic bacteria had st heat stable stuff, right? So we had, we had actually I had, I had the first PCR machine in, in Seattle and uh, I broke the first PCR machine in Seattle. <laughs> eight hours later. <laughs> well, they said, they said that when you were done, it could cool it down to, to four degrees, you know, and, and so I, we ran it overnight, and I came in the morning, and um, it basically it just, uh, uh, the condensation went through all the circuits and blew them out, and so I, I asked guys, I said, you say you can do four degrees? They said, oh, no, you didn't do that, did you? <laughs> it says right here. <laughs> so we can do now, use this technology to pick out people who still have disease when the pathologist says you're free of disease, right? So this is CML patients who got transplanted. And this uh, is looking at, by PCR, where again, we, we can get one copy in a million, really amazing sensitivity. Your probability of relapsing after a transplant based on copy number. So if you're free of negative tests, you're fine. But if you have just one copy number, you have a 20% chance of relapsing. If you have 100 copies, you have a 40% chance, right? These are people who look to all the world to be completely cured of their disease by conventional methods. So once you know that, you can start doing things to fix it. You can start looking at patients, yeah? 40 out of a million? Yeah, 40 out of a million, yeah. So you can start doing things to fix it. You can say, well, if you're at risk of 20%, we've got to give you some other therapy. Interferon, more T cells, there's all sorts of things you can do to basically to do that. And so, so this basically allowed us to, to develop protocols that would, where we could abort relapse in people who otherwise we'd, we'd wait probably about six months to nine months before they actually relapse again, right? Now this is carried over to the non-transplant setting. This is the same kind of technology, and this is looking at the IRIS trial I was telling you about. And this is looking at patients at a, a year out and saying, these, they all look the same, excuse me, they all look like they're doing okay. 
if you have a three-log three reduction, a thousand-fold reduction or not. If you have a thousand-fold reduction or more, you're great. If you're more than that, you're not so great, right? So pretty good, but you can basically start to look at points here on, conven on the Gleevec therapy and kind of predict what path you're on. And that's at 12 months, but what we found is you can actually go back to three months now. So you can take people, CML patients who are treated with Gleevec and based on their level of molecular response, you can basically say, these guys are great, these guys have to do something different, right? So you don't have to wait for them to relapse. You don't have to do bone marrows. These are all done in peripheral blood, so you don't have to do bone marrows anymore in these people. So you can just do peripheral blood monitoring and, and tell who's going to do well, who's not going to do well. So this has really kind of shaped how we treat patients in CML and, and, and also in some of the other diseases, but CML has been the model of that. And at the end, we'll talk about a, a really powerful tool of this, but I'm going to leave that hanging. because a whole, whole different application we didn't expect. Now, you can even get more sensitive than PCR. So this is a, an interesting study. This is, when we first started doing tyrosine kinases in CML, we thought people would have to be on these drugs forever. Because if you take the so-called CML stem cell and, and put it in culture, you can throw tyrosine kinases on top of it and it just sits there. It doesn't die. Any differentiated cells die, but the stem cells don't die. They just kind of like hang out. And so we thought, well, if that's the case, you'll have to be on tyrosine kinases forever because once you take off the tyrosine kinases, your disease is going to go back, right? So it turns out, again, we were wrong. This was a recurring theme is how often we're wrong. Um, so these are patients who have been free by PCR for two years of disease. So even by the PCR test, they're free of disease for two years. And you say, what happens if we take them off? So the bet was everyone relapses. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, and then what it shows is that all these people here relapse, but there's a 40% of them actually stay in complete molecular remission for up to two years. We have no idea how that happens, right? But what we'd like to do is because these people when they relapse, they relapse pretty quickly, they all respond again, but they all don't go back into CMR. So we don't know if that's risky. We don't know if letting someone escape therapy for three months, nine months, actually puts them on a path of progression. So we don't know if we're not doing these people harm. So what we'd like to do is say, well, can we predict up here which people are going to relapse and which ones aren't? Because if we can predict that, then we're not going to offer discontinuation to anyone who we know is going to relapse, right? That'd be stupid, right? So, how do you do that? Well, if, you, if your test is one in a million, how can you make that test more sensitive? But when you're talking about one in a million, you're talking about rare events, right? You have a sample of blood, you take a part of that and do the PCR. If you have one in 10 to the seventh cells, you might have just missed it, right? So one way you can, you can basically do that is to do more PCRs on one sample. So the brute force way of that is having your tech basically, instead of doing one test, do 10 tests, do 100 tests, that's hard to do, it's a labor intensive, it takes time. Is there another way you can do it? And there is. So, the show and tell. Those of you who expect rabbits or anything? There, there is a Rolo, if someone would like a Rolo. Yeah, a couple of Rolos for the best questions get Rolos. Um, so, this is thing here, I'll show, I can pass around later. Um, it looks like there's a hologram here, right? Um, there's a company called, well it's still called, Fluidime. Uh, who's out of San Francisco. And what they do is they build um, th what they call microfluidic chambers. And these are chambers that hold roughly 50 picoliters of volume. A picoliter is a billionth of a liter. You can't see a picoliter, but you can put it in a well if you design it right. And so what they designed this for was uh, crystals. Because it turns out that crystals grow better for reasons that aren't clear to non-physicists like myself in s very small um, volumes. They have different kinetics of crystal growth and, and purity than, than normal ways. And so they grew for that. Then they came to the hutch and said, you know, we can make these things and we can actually, you know, we can address volumes in these, all these little holes, here, right? Is there anything you could do with it? And it's just, it's just, uh, I love working with engineers because they build something and say, now what are we going to do with this thing? It's really cool. <laughs> and we said, well, could you hook it up to a thermocycler? And they said, like most engineers, sure we can do that, you know, sure. And then you talk, really? And well, may maybe we can do that, you know. <laughs> so this is um, a chamber, and this has uh, not one, not two, this has 10,000 separate wells in it. So you can actually distribute volume and do 10,000 PCRs simultaneously, right? And so that's what it looks like. Uh, 
you put in your fluid, like this could be your sample, you put in your reagents, and then you do PCR. And this is what the, the channels look like. So again, these are micron levels, and these things are actually tubes. And these tubes are flexible materials, and so they lay on top of each other. And you distribute the samples in the right place by coordinating the pumps, because when one opens, it actually pinches the other one, and vice versa. So you can distribute f fluid to your address by, by a very complicated pump system. And it actually, uh, actually works, which is kind of amazing enough. So, so this is what you get if you do a digital. These are, actually, pop up. So you can get so-called digital readouts, where, where if you get amplification, you can stain it, and these are positives. These are your negative controls. These are the ones that have positives in all of them, right? So this is rare events happening. And those rare events can be charted on something called a Poisson distribution, which is, uh, give, can, makes you allow you to calculate rare numbers. And you can actually do quantitative PCR, where these are the, the curves of the actual reagents increasing, and you can see you can look here and say, okay, is that schmutz or is that an actual signal, right? You know, so you can go and look and say, oh, yeah, that is signal. That's, not this, this, that's all the neighbors. So it's really quite, re quite remarkable technology. And you can get down to, if you do 10 copies, one copy, which is a limited detection, here at 0.1 copy, you don't see it, but this is like one in 10 of the cells. You pick it up here. You can get down about two logs more sensitive. So you can really pick up on a good day one copy in 10 to the eighth normal. So unbelievable sensitivity, right? And so what we have now are trials where you know, we will act, we're actually looking at patients who are in these discontinuation trials and saying, can we just pick out who's the winners, who's the losers, so that we can actually get people off drug that can stay off drug and not expose them to the risk of being off drugs. Because you know, when I talk to some of my colleagues that do mutational work, they say, you're taking patients off drug and it works? You guys are nuts. And so there's just risk involved, right? There's risk and reward. So we talk about being, detecting relapse, but is there a way where we can understand why it happens, right? So there's three patterns of relapse. So imagine someone here starting our old diagram, they're on therapy, and they go down and they come back up, okay? How does that happen? Well, I'll argue that probably what happens there is clonal selection, that you wipe out the cells that are sensitive and the ones that are resistant go. There are those patients who kind of you know, go like this, and then once you get them off therapy, they relapse, and it may well be there that you're just not driving it down long enough, right? The disease is deep enough that if you kept giving more therapy, it might keep going. And then there are these ones out here, and we won't get into this, but there are late relapses that occur in leukemia, and probably there you've actually possibly caused a new leukemia. You've introduced chemotherapy to normal stem cells, and they probably uh, you know, don't like it, and relapse three, four, five years to get uh, down the road. So, <laughs> This, again, shows how old I am. There was a time when you actually listened to comedy acts on vinyl records, right? This was the Fireside Theater. Their pitch line was, everything you know is wrong, which is what I try to emphasize to my lab and try to reinforce. I mean, then that's not just science. It's basically everything you know is wrong, right? It, it really. You know, all your beliefs, everything, is, they're, probably, they're probably wrong. It's easy to be, much easier to be, be wrong than right. So when, when we used to do, think about evolution and mutations, because we know that patients will accumulate mutations over time. We used to think of this thing where like, okay, you had one cell, and then it went into, and it got uh, mutation one, and then it went into, and it got mutation one, and then it accumulated another mutation. So this very, very linear type of progression of, of mutations, right? So that's, that's probably not right at all. Um, so this, is, this isn't to scare you. This just shows that for, these are common mutations in AML. And um, this is kind of a circus plot. It just shows that these are the, the different mutations. And it shows that certain mutations kind of naturally occur with other mutations. And the width of the plot is basically you know, how frequent it is. And what it basically shows is there's lots of different combinations of mutations that can happen in leukemia cells. So imagine that this is what happens in therapy. So I'm very simple-minded. That plot, right? So you can have your homogeneous re resistance. So you have a tumor that just happens to be fairly homogeneous in the content. Not a lot of clones, a few, but they're resistant. So in that case, you're stuck. And then you have the people who win. They're relatively homogeneous, but they're lucky. They're pretty sensitive, right? So they go that way. 
And here's the vast majority where you have a heterogeneous population that basically you are hitting natural selection here. You wipe out the mutants or, or the, the, good, the cells you can, and the cells come back. Now, this is, again, too complicated to really explain. What it shows is looking at patients who had one mutation. By the time they, they start therapy, they have multiple mutations. They get therapy, they relapse with one of these clones, they've gotten rid of these other, these other three clones. This is by just taking whole genome sequencing and, and sequencing the gamish. Now, the problem with whenever you take thousands of cells and just sequence all of them is you can, if you have different mutations that have strikingly different frequencies, so let's say you have an NPM1 mutation that's in 60% of the, the calls, and another mutation that's only in 10% of the sample, in that case, you've got to have two clones, right? There's no way those two things can exist. But the assumptions when you take the whole gamish, if two of them have the same frequency, they say, okay, they're probably in the same clone. Okay, that's probably not true at all. Right? And so how do you get around that? Well, you get around it by, by, the only way we know to get around it by is by single cell sequencing. So what we do is we take samples and we actually individually sort each cell into a well. And then we, by brute force, do the genotyping and see what the clonal construction is. And so, in reality, this is what we find when we get diagnostic samples. The pies are just different, different genes, they're just different combination of genes. So you can have patients that at diagnosis have five, six, ten different clones of cells, right? They've had a mass, match diversity. And, and the way to think about this is we've spent so much time worrying about that cancer is this fight against of the cancer cell versus our normal cell, right? That's, that's the battle. The cancer cells are fighting against each other. They, they, you know, it's natural selection. They don't care if, you, if my brother in cancer cell does well or not. They, the fight is there, right? And so what we have right now is when we treat people, we often treat them with the same type of chemotherapy over and over again. We're basically using natural selection against us. Right? It's, a, it's a kind of amazing we ever cure anyone, right? Yeah. Frankly, I mean, it is. So what we have to do is figure out how these clonal diversity changes and figure out a way to use natural selection on our side instead of against us. Because right now, we've got, you know, we're just against nature. And again, it's quite amazing that we ever, ever cure anyone. So this, is, um, this has now been seen not only in leukemias, but in other diseases. These are just complicated maps of clonal structures um, that basically defy this. This isn't happening. You're having some, you have to start with one mutate cell first, but they diverge very quickly. You get these strange maps. Curiously enough, Darwin had thought about this way before. This is his, from his notebook. He says, I think. And this is basically how he thought the various species of finches diverged. Not in a line, but uh, an outpouring and just massive free-for-all of different evolutionary possibilities. So this is, again, just schematically what we think is going on. It's basically we're just getting natural selection. And that's what we have to figure out how to use to our benefit instead of against this. So let's talk about the future for a minute. So um, Yogi Berra said it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, little did I know, I mean, Berra, Hall of Famer, Sage, and the like, that he was actually uh, a devotee to Niels Bohr, theoretical physicist, because Niels said the same thing before. Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And we've certainly made a lot of mistakes in past predictions, right? <laughs> I, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for the flying car. It just doesn't come, right? That's really too bad. But thank God the bodysuit that appears in almost every futuristic sci-fi stuff did never took hold, right? That's his one we <laughs> But here's what's going to happen very soon, if not now. We talked about how you can use these, these molecular markers, and they predict survival, OK? Molecular surrogates will soon be used as endpoints to clinical trials. And I'll give you an example of how that's already happening. We'll, we'll, we'll get to understand clonal diversity and use it rather than it use us. And technology will benefit the lives of other cancer patients in developing countries. And I want to spend a little time on that because I think that's a very important I issue. Here's two examples of minimal residual disease as a surrogate outpouring. This is in CML, as we talked about. This is in pediatric ALL, where actually minimal residual disease at the time of induction end, 30 days, you can pretty much predict who's going to do that and who's going to do that. Right? Traditional trials have always been survival, right? So most trials that they go out are five to 10-year trials, because that's usually what you have to need for survival. So in CML, 
we went to the FDA a few years ago and said, we, we can predict who's going to do well and who's not by 12 months. Why do we need a five-year trial? So all of the last three agents, new agents in CML that have been approved by the FDA have all been done in one-year trials. They basically have changed 10-year trials to one-year trials. We've, we just had a conversation last week with the FDA and the NIH about MRD, and we're thinking that we're going to be an AOL will soon be able to, again, go from five-year trials to maybe six-month trials. So you can imagine what that does. I mean, basically, they're much cheaper, and you can siphon through drugs. Right now, it takes a drug five-year trial to die, right? And for most drugs, you could probably tell after six months whether it should be going forward or not, right? So you can just cycle through drugs amazingly faster, right? So I think that's something that we, when we started embarking on this decade or so ago, we had no idea that we'd actually get to move it in that direction. The second issue is how we're going to do this single cell stuff, right? My, I, my poor tech does this by hand. We can't do that. And if I get any luck here, I can actually drive this. Oops. So this is, these chambers hold about 50 picoliters. They're engineered to hold, be basically one cell diameter. This is by David Chu, who's an engineer over at UW. So what he can do now is he can actually put fluid, this is basically address it through, put it in here, and he can actually now starting to do it where we can put cells in there. So we can actually take cells, do what we call flow cytometry, sort them into individual wells. And how this works on a cellular level, it's almost like you imagine that um, an egg carton, so you cut up an egg carton and put it in series instead of parallel, and then you bounce the eggs down. The eggs like, bounce into a hole, and the next one bounces over that and goes to the next hole, right? So once we can actually do that, we can actually start doing genotyping on tens of thousands of cells simultaneously, right? So we've got a grant to do that, and I think that's actually probably going to work. The last show and tell part, again, to show how interesting we've gone, is you might remember the anthrax attacks, right? After 2001, um, things were sent to Tom Brokaw, Senator Dash and the like. Several people died. Not sure how it happened, but it went through the mail, right? Because of that, there was a big push on how to screen mail. Right? And there was a company, uh, which is still is called Cepheid, um, which is a diagnostics company, uh, which builds automated ways to do PCR. And it's very clever. And so right now, so what you do is you have these cartridges. These cartridges have different holes on the top. And these cartridges come with all the reagents for PCR freeze-dried in them, or just dried in them. So what you can do is take any bodily fluid, saliva, blood, urine, whatever, just squirt it in one of the tubes, put it in the machine. It will actually go through, extract the RNA, and do the quantitative PCR without you ever touching it. Right? So every all the major post offices in the United States now are tested for anthrax by this technology. So what happens is, is Grumman builds these, uh, these fume hoods, pulls up all the air when the mail's sliding by, they, they distill that into a few drops, they run a PCR, the mail doesn't go out if the, if, unless the anthrax test is negative. Right? So they start off as being a bioterrorism country. They got a, a company, they got anthrax, they got into Rikete, they got all these bioterrorism stuff. So when the first Middle East war happened, they had PCR machines there plugged in for all this stuff because they were gearing up for anthrax. So uh, we got interested in, in CML. Um, and so that you can actually now do basically CML testing where you just take blood and, and put it in and, and snap it in. And so why is that interesting to developing countries? Well, it's interesting because in developing, doing PCR by hand is actually very time consuming. It actually takes a lot of technical expertise. It takes very sophisticated uh, training and the like. It's hard for developing countries to do it. However, the WHO has endorsed the tests of m malaria, uh, HIV, TB using this technology. This technology runs 16 panels at the same time. So if you have a CML patient, you can just punch it in while they're doing a TB test, right? So, you, so this actually takes almost no technical expertise at all, right? So what we've been doing is um, Novartis, uh, which makes amantinib, actually will give free drug for life in developing countries where their, where their co country can't afford amantinib. If you can prove they have CML. 
So most of these, these countries can't do cytogenetics, they can't do PCR, right? So for about five years, we've been doing all the PCR free for El Salvador and a couple other countries in, uh, in South America. So we get the test, we tell them we've got CML to get free drug for life. So we've now done that in Honduras and we've done that in Uzbekistan. And here's my tech, uh, Jordan in, in, in Uzbekistan training people. So Jordan became like the, the mayor of uh, the capital of Uzbekistan the first week he was here. These are all patients who have CML, who, who were basically destined to die in seven years, right? So he diagnosed, taught him to diagnose four of them in the first week. So those people all got free drug, right? And so, that, so they all probably will live normal lifespans now for the most of them. So, so with these kind of efforts, you can actually make pretty huge progress. This is actually uh, a, a, a guy in um, sub-Saharan Africa riding his camel to go get his PCR test. So he can actually go, go get free drug for life. So I'll conclude with this slide. So this is the natural history of most things. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> romance, lo golf clubs. If you've ever had a, the, the experience of owning an uh, English sports car, right? <laughs> Excitement, <laughs> engine block dead in 5,000 miles, right? That's what happened, right? And this is what happens with everything, with, with PCR, with genomics, everything. Right? You get this initial excitement, and there's this disappointment when you realize it, it doesn't solve all human problems. But I think with the type of stuff we're doing now, we've gone through this road. We're here in reality. We're actually figuring out how to use this stuff for a way that we can actually make a, a huge impact on, on, on how we treat patients, how we design trials, how we take care of people uh, across the world. And with that, I will give you my lab. <laughs> Thanks. It was kind of long-winded, but we've got some time. Uh, Dr. Radich, so you, you talk about the fact that in reality, what we'll probably have is different clones in there. And so that if, we're, if we actually treat it with one drug or what have you, we'll get after one of those or yeah. maybe three of those, but there'll always be one left. So where do you think the next step is? Once Will we identify what those clones are, yeah. and then will we have to actually devise something that will hit each one of those clones? Yeah, so... so um, I, I think that, that where targeted therapy comes in is in CML, it, you know, it's kind of the poster child of targeted therapy. But in CML, in chronic phase, you really have just one mutation, so you can actually target it. In some of these other leukemias, you've got too many targets up front. So I think the strategy will be to hit something that hits as broad as possible. And when you have residual disease, we can actually now capture those cells. We can actually do a marrow, do a peripheral blood, identify those cells, flow sort them, and then work on those. So I think that the, 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 the thing will be Reduce it, grab that clone, see what clones survived, and what it's sensitive to. Yeah. So how, how soon is soon that you had on your slide? I mean, if I know somebody who's in cancer therapy right now, should I have them insist they go to their oncologist and say, you need to call Fred Hutch and get this person on genetic testing for their endpoints right now, or is this five years away or ten years away? The surrogate trials are happening now, right? That, that's developing, right? So I think that's true. The, the, for a lot of these diseases now, we can track them by minimal residual disease. It's, that can be done now. What we don't have now is um, I can't tell you who's going to respond and who's not, right? Um, I suspect that that will be within a year or so, two years maybe. So what we have to do is we first have to do, we have to get the bioinformatics people, then we have to kind of validate it on another group of patients, make sure it really sticks, right? But this is doable, you know. I mean, this this is this is this is doable. I had a, co a question that's an ethical consideration around if you begin to develop the idea, the notion that uh, patients will or will not respond to therapy, and you can test that. What are the ethics behind the use that use of that technology in rationing medical care? Have you thought those? That, what's your response to that? Yeah, yeah. So. so um, you know, I, th I think if, if, you were, if you were a drug company, if you were a farm insurance agent, right, you might take a different tack than pharma or we would, right? So they might say, well, you've got this test. You're not going to respond. But it's probably better off that they, if you look at the costs of what happens when patients, you know, it's chemotherapy is one of them. The other is when they get sick, when they fail and the like. So if you were a 
a health insurance company, you might say, well, if I know you're going to fail conventional therapy, I want you to go on a clinical trial because I know what's going to happen the other way. You know, you're going to get sick, you're going to go to the ICU, you're going to, you know, the cost pile up. Whereas, you know, if in the long run, I might end up paying less if you basically get well in a hurry, right? Because the other way is just pour money down the drain, right? So I think what you have to do, really what we have to do in, in all this healthcare stuff is we have to pit, um, you know, there's two divergent issues with healthcare, right? There's the health insurance company who actually would prefer that you die as quickly as possible. And then there's a life insurance company that wants you to live forever, right? So what we have to do is actually create legislation that says if you offer life insurance, you have to offer health insurance. If you offer health insurance, you have to offer life insurance, right? Because, because the life insurance people want to make sure that you're getting your colonoscopy, you're getting good therapy, because they're making money every year you survive, right? So. Uh, two questions. One, I don't know what PCR is. Okay, so... so, it's pull, it's so Polymerase, which is the enzyme to do it, chain reaction. Okay. And the other is I'm old enough to remember uh, Fire Sign Theater. And I remember in the 60s, the war on cancer was uh, declared. Yeah. And uh, so it's 50 years later, and I'm wondering why the war is so long. The war is so long because... There, it's, it's, it's so many things. So it's one, it, it's, it's that the, the complexity of the tumors are much more complex than we thought. I mean, we thought that this was, you know, that, that these were just clones. They were the same thing. And that if you, you found the right drug and hit it, they would all die, right? The fact that, that you basically have so many clones makes that obstacle very difficult, right? Because it turns out that, that one of the problems is when you're looking here and you're saying, Gee, what you know? What could do with the genetic complexity here? You know, can we predict anything? Well, pro unfortunately, in this kind of case, the cell that kills you, the clone that kills you, isn't the prominent clone, right? So you're doing an analysis on ones that are sort of bystanders that aren't really going to be the ones that kill you, right? Yeah. And a lot of other things. Um, how does flow cytometry fit into, like, how does that compare to the PCR test, and is that available yeah. for use in AML? Yep, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, for, so flow cytometry. So, so what happens is um, when cells go down that pathway that I showed you of, of, of differentiation, they have completely stereotyped expression of different proteins on their cell surface. And that changes as they become more differentiated and the like. And so you can get colored antibodies that stick to those things. And by the type of, of, of what we call the antigens show up and what density, you can basically say this person is normal or this is an aberrant type of expression. And, and leukemic cells have aberrant expression. So um, most PCR assays can detect 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000 cells. Um, flow cytometry can reliably predict one in 10,000 cells. And that actually, for predicting relapse and not, that may be pretty good. And so for a lot of diseases, um, for AML and um, in ALL, flow cytometry is often used because it's a very quick measure and, it's, and it really works quite well. There's new technologies with the next generation sequencing that is probably going to be really, really sensitive and probably similarly fast. But for right now, the acute leukemia is flow cytometry at good flow labs, like the one across the street is the best in the world, um, is really, really good at picking out residual disease. Because you know, it's probably, you know, at some point, it may well be that you can't eliminate all leukemia cells. Even people are cured. If you looked hard enough, you'd probably find something there, right? Um, and I don't know if that's, we don't know if that's the immune system riding herd and the like, but there's probably it's just mathematically impossible to eliminate all of them. So the sensitivity that flow cytometry has, which is like 1 in 10,000 stuff, if you're negative by flow cytometry, you're in pretty good shape. You're probably out of the woods. Well, yeah, well you have to be negative for a long time. Yeah. What happened in 1987? The charts showed two of the types of leukemia going up at that point. Oh, so part of that was because they were redefined on what was uh, 
what was a leukemia. So it's a definition issue. Yeah. Are you exploring other methods than the chemotherapy approach uh, that might be efficacious? In Me personally, or, or as a, as a center? <laughs> just, just in general. Yeah. Um, I, th I think probably where, where uh, a lot of people are, are, are interested in is various immunotherapy approaches. Basically, you know, training your immune system or someone else's immune system to kind of take care and ride herd. And we know the immune system has a, a huge effect on preventing relapse. And the, the best model of that is probably in transplantation, where um, if, if I am your identical twin, and you get a transplant, uh, if you have an acute leukemia, um, you don't get any of graft disease. I don't attack you at all. You, know, you don't try to reject me. We're the same person as far as nature is concerned, right? Um, the relapse rate is about 50%, right? If I'm your tissue match sibling but not identical, that goes down to about 10%. And that's because there's any leftover cell in you the immune system wants to attack. So there's ways that we can try to marshal that type of effect in a non-transplant setting. How do you treat them? Um, they're, they're very small hoops. <laughs> small carrots? Yes, yeah. What, 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 uh, you actually have to uh, genetically engineer them. So there's ways that you can actually take s cells, actually uh, put genes in them that allow them to recognize antigens on the leukemia cells. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, the oncogene diagnosis, uh, is this on? Where are you? Oh, over here. Okay. <laughs> oh. I, I was wondering how similar what you're talking about, um, what you're talking about, how similar it is to the oncogene recurrence score for breast cancer and some of the other ones. Yeah. And then um, it, it was kind of interesting because I had that done and then they were like, there's these proprietary things where they don't tell you which genes you looked at or what, you know, how, why your score is whatever it is. And then how do we prevent companies from having patents on some of these genetic oh. things that limit <laughs> yeah. more people from benefiting? Yeah, so the first question, uh, it's, it's, it, the approach is similar to the, the oncogene test. It's, it's conceptually the same, the same issue. The issue on patent stuff is a complete mess. Uh, and there are... Um, I mean, there are companies that troll for patents in, in oncogenes. There's uh, one particular company that I won't tell you what it is, but, but they basically buy uh, interesting patents from Japan, the Netherlands, and the like, and then basically hold trials hostage, saying that, you know, you can't do this test and the like. And I think that's, um, that can only be done by you guys, basically. Uh, you know, trying as hard you can to work with state representatives and the like to try to change the laws because, there, you know, there's issues with that and like you're talking about with, with trying to actually read what your genes are up and down, right? That's, that's kind of silly. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. And, um, and that stuff has to be changed. It has to be changed by probably a grassroots level. Industry has no reason to do, change it. So, um, so far you've been looking at uh, leukemia and looking at this issue of uh, diversity, clonal diversity. Um, has there been any opportunity to look at other types of cancer? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, so, I, I don't do that, but if I go back to, 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 to that. So, that's renal cancer. That's ALL. That's breast. Same thing's happened with lung now. So, you know, we used to think... So, we're seeing the same phenomenon. Yeah, same phenomenon. So, so, we used to think that, like, if you, if you looked at... Uh, at a primary tumor in the lung and they looked at the metastases that they would be like, you know, all the same and they're like not. They're different clones entirely. That, I assume that's fairly disappointing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it means that this is to us, yeah, to, to, yeah, Yeah, to us, it's not disappointing to the tumor. No, it's a win for the tumor. Yeah. Going back to the woman's question about the oncogene comparison, um, and maybe this isn't a question, but maybe a uh, comment. There's still going to be an investment made of people and death to determine who will respond and who will not. Yep. And I think we're not, we always want the fast uh, acting solution. 
and st there's still going to be people who have to pave the way. Yeah. And they, and they will be patients. And mm -hmm. there will be survivors, survivors, and there will not be survivors. And they will, and from them we will profit. But yeah. I well. Because I think we all think when we look at this, we think it's going to be. No, no, yeah, yeah. And it's never. I mean, that's that curve, right? <laughs> that's yeah. You know, it's it's right. it's yeah. I, it, you need to get to the point where you can look at the who would respond and who will not. Those were, those were people who. Okay. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's 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 yeah. It's absolutely. It's it's it's. Uh, Participating in a clinical trial is a very, very brave and, uh, you know, noble thing to do because there's never any assurance that it's going to work, right? So, I mean, the, the success that we have in the Hutch transplant is, like, paved by people who, you know, took the chance and, and in some cases, you know, didn't do well for other people to benefit. It's a hard thing. On that and on some of the other things, there is an author named Jay Lake who is a colon cancer patient in a trial, which I believe is what you're talking about, that they basically are culturing his cancer cells to try to teach them to attack each other, if I understand right. He's blogging his way through that if you want to look at what that kind of thing might be, and it might take why, why Dr. Radich out of the Why don't you say the name again for people? Jay Lake, J-A-Y-L-A-K-E. -E. Okay. And he's blogging his experience through the, ex the experimental process he's in. But even that, it's such a challenge that he actually had to crowdfund the money to be able to go participate in the study. Right. You were uh, talking about... <laughs> you were talking about training cells yeah. to find and locate these clone cells. Right. Uh, is that in the lab only with samples, or can that be done in the body as well? We don't know if it can be done in, in vivo yet, right? Right now, it's all being done. You take the cells, you do it in the lab, and you put them back in the patient, right? I mean, there's obviously, in, in normal people, there's a huge education of the immune system, right? The problem is when you have cancer, your immune system is sort of obviously declared a truce or has gotten confused or isn't doing its, its job, right? So if you can, re re curious if you can re-educate that or not. And the problem you have when you give chemotherapy and the like is you actually blunt the immune system, right? So your immune system's ability to learn new things when you're attacking it with chemotherapy is greatly blunted. So you, you almost have to go, before I know right now, you almost have to like get those cells out of there, right? And then do your education outside and then put them back in. Uh, so I had some questions about uh, imatinib, the Gleevec. Um, so I think you said that originally the thought was that it needed to be taken forever. Yep. But then, and so how long is it on average taken for before somebody reaches a remission stage? Uh, well, the, the average time to remission is, uh, is roughly 12 months. But, but when people who stay on it, you know, and the drug's been out now about 13 years. So mm -hmm. that's about as much experience as we have with it out that far. Okay, so they may take it for forever. Yeah. Oh, they do. So people do stay on it forever. Yeah. Then. Oh, yeah. okay. And um, for somebody who relapses, you have to give them something different. Then is that right? Yeah, you you have to give them. There are th there are four other drugs that you can potentially give them, and and that's based on how they relapse. Because because in in CML, you, the most common type of relapse is they actually get a a, a single point mutation in that able gene. And so it changes the conformation of the gene, and the drug doesn't bind anymore. And depending on what mutation it is, can dictate what drug might work. Okay. And um, so the other drugs that are given are also targeted? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Okay. And um, do patients tend to get kidney damage because of Gleevec? You know, it's been seen in the mouse model, but in, uh, in general, in the long-term follow-up, it hasn't come up as a signal. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. What kind of cell did you say was blunted by the chemotherapy again? Most of the immune cells, the B and T cells. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, oh, you're welcome. I can tell I'm going to need a tutor if I'm going to pass this class. <laughs> 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 so I'll be the slow student. I have a friend who has been treated for AML at SCCA and thank to all of you for the fact that she's alive two years later. Uh, so she had a bone marrow transplant and about a 
you're past that now. And my question is, is this science uh, being applied? So someone in her shoes, just a year or two out, is going to get a different form of treatment that will perhaps give her a different result in terms of a possible relapse. You mean treating her now? Yes. So what she probably is having done now is when they do routine bone marrows, they will be doing some sophisticated tests on her to see if they can find any residual disease, right? So that's one thing to get early starts. That, that's uh, applied. Um, that's the main thing that they would be doing at this point, right? So um, there's work going on. We talked about chemotherapy, but there's work going on in our lab to take patients at diagnosis and throughout their therapy, again, to see how clones change, right? Because it, it's, easier to, it's easier to conceive how clones change with chemotherapy. But the same thing happens in transplant. We know that, that when people relapse, their disease can be different than when they were diagnosed. And it's supposedly that clonal selection happens in transplantation as well. So presumably, you know, in the future, if you were able to do that and see residual cells that had some different clonal structure, you might give them therapy right then while they were still in remission rather than wait for them to relapse. But at a year out, that's pretty good remission. So that's, you know, most of the relapses are within the first year and then some more after two years and then and into two years and then pretty much flat after. So to follow up on that question, you talked about the clonal structure changing. So how often do you have to do the genetic testing to predict the remission, staying in remission versus coming back? Oh, we don't know. <laughs> That's the easy question. We, have, we, we don't know how often to test are going to need to be done. From a practical standpoint right now, since we're using bone marrow to do those tests, you can really only do it probably every two to three months. Leukemia is one of those diseases that we hear about ho showing up in children. And I was curious about, from this, what age does it typically hit and none not? Or, does it, or can it hit any time? In, it in really depends on what leukemia you're talking about. In ALL, there's a peak that goes up very early, then kind of dies down, then goes back up again. With acute myeloid leukemia, it's pretty stable until about age 50, and then sort of all hell breaks loose and it starts going like that. And in CML, kind of the same thing. It's kind of low, and then once you get in the 40s and 50s, it starts climbing. And your major, your most, you know, in, you know, your major risk factor for all cancers is age. You know, there's lots of bad things happen. You know, our, our telomeres get short, and you know, we accumulate mutations kind of randomly. So, um, you know, take your vacation time. <laughs> 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 thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks. 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 Thanks for coming and staying in conversation with us on our Facebook page, YouTube, Twitter, redhatch.org. Safe night. Thank you.